Hello, Hubble Huggers, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and I know you're not going to believe this, but we've done it again. We've got another great hangout plan for you today. We're going to be talking about a very special kind of star called Wolf Rayet stars. I always want to use my southern accent and call them Wolf Rayette, but I just, uh, I guess I'll, I'll use a correct pronunciation today. But in particular, we're also going to be talking about a very strange kind of star, even within this subset of stars, uh, which has been nicknamed... Every time I say this, I always think this might be a, a license plate for uh, a license, like a personalized license plate for Scott or something. Nasty yeah, one. Really? You're in Florida. <laughs> nasty you're in Florida. one. Come on, nasty one would be a Florida license plate. Yeah, that's what you're right with it. <laughs> so anyway, one. <laughs> So anyway, we're going to be talking about this very interesting star today with uh, with our guests. But before I get started, I want to invite you guys to send us your questions and comments. Uh, and also, if you have not subscribed to us on YouTube, you need to do that on the Hubble Site channel as well as follow us on Twitter with at space or at Hubble Telescope. And I'm and with me every week, as they always are, is Dr. Carol Christian. She's the Hubble Outreach Scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. Hi, Carol. Hello. Hello. And also Scott Lewis, who's here to help us with the social media and driving of the internet all around. Uh, good guy. Hi, Scott. It's good to see you again. I wouldn't say I'm a good guy, but well, thank you're you, nasty, Tony. Nasty, very, guy, yeah. Yeah. nasty one. Nasty one. <laughs> nasty one. Nasty that's gonna be one. Yeah, that's going to be on. That needs to be on your lower third. Now, now I need a new Twitter handle. That's right. If I don't have enough. I think John and no. Okay, so uh, before we get started, uh, Scott, why don't you tell people how they can leave their questions and comments because uh, we hope that you will get uh, a lot of interaction with you guys uh, throughout the Hangout. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, so the, the best way for you to get engaged with us is through the Q&A app, which is both engaged on Google Plus and on YouTube. So on the very bottom left, you'll see some yellow text there saying that we're answering your questions because we are. It will load up a new interface. And it'll allow you to answer questions, and you can even upvote different questions. So if you see a question that somebody's asked and you want to know the same thing, you can upvote it. Also, like Tony said before, we are over on Hubble Telescope, and we're using the hashtag Hubble Hangout. And so I'm monitoring that, and I'll be live tweeting as we're going along there. So please let us know any uh, questions or comments or anything else that you'd like the, uh, the panel to respond to, and we'll get those going throughout the show. Great. Thank you, Scott. So joining me, uh, as I said before, we have uh, uh, astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope to look at this very special class of stars known as Wolf Ray A stars. And joining me is Dr. John Mauerhan from the University of California at Berkeley. He's an astronomer there. Welcome, John. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to talk with you. So a couple of weeks ago, we did a press release on some of your observations on these stars. And I want to get to your science here in just a minute. But before I do, let's give people a little bit of background on what these stars are. These are a subclass. We, I mean, astronomers love to do this. They, cl they classify and catalog everything. This is a special type of star. Why don't you tell us what they are? Well, wolf Ray star is you know, an evolved state of the most massive stars uh, in the galaxy and in other galaxies. And what makes them, what highlights them observationally is that they've lost a certain amount of their hydrogen envelopes. You know, most stars are 90% hydrogen, and a lot of that's in the envelopes surrounding it. They've lost these envelopes through winds and eruptions and other processes we'll get into such that the, the surface becomes very hot, the visible surface is very hot as you expose deeper and deeper layers. Uh, it becomes almost like a helium core, if it can. So um, these stars are observationally characterized by very strong emission lines of helium. Uh, very strong winds are often surrounded by nebulae. So when you look at the spectrum of these stars, you see a, a very bright uh, feature in the, where, where helium would be uh, in emission, right? Right. So, that's, that's one of the keys, is that you have to see a line of singly ionized helium, what we call helium-2. That shows you that the temperatures in the stellar atmosphere and its wind are high enough. To be so they have. So these are, stars. as you said before, they're they're very massive stars. How compared to our sun, how big are they generally? Well, the traditional model uh, says that stars about 25 solar masses or greater can become. Wow, really? Great so our stars. sun will not do this. Our sun will not pass through De this stage in its evolution. Definitely not. Okay. So, uh, but more recent models are showing that you can actually get wolf ray stars in a lower mass range than we thought, and uh, that's one of the interesting. Uh, you know, 
relative so about topics 20... for nasty one. <laughs> about twenty five. Sorry, <laughs> you're gonna have to. I'm gonna laugh every time you say it. it yeah, that might be the, that may be the topic <laughs> of this week's drinking game. Um, so the the uh, the they're roughly twenty five times the mass of our sun, and because they're primarily burning helium, that means that they are pretty old, right? They're pretty far along in their in their lives. Is that true? Well, they're probably 90% through their life, but the stars that do this actually don't live very long, just uh, less than 10 million years, maybe only several million years. You mean this stage in their life cycle? This is a pretty small window when, they, when they're like this. Right. So, uh, you know, they've probably been alive for several million years, and the, the stage at which they, over which they display these wolf ray properties is probably only on the order of 100,000 years or several hundred thousand years. So... Uh, a okay, fraction so Scott, of their lifetime. So Scott's got an image up here. Is this one now? Is this what we're looking at? Yeah, that's a very famous wolf ray star, and the nebula is called uh, M1-67. And you can see it's surrounded by this spectacular nebulosity that uh, you can see from the structure it appears to be flowing away from the star, and it is. How that's is this different? Material. That is like a planetary nebula to me. How is that different? Well, um the processes by which the wind is generated are a little different. This is driven by radiation pressure from the star, we think. Um, very strong winds from these stars, just from the, the sheer force of their radiation, pushes, puts pressure on the envelope and drives a very strong wind. If, this, if the wind is very uh, thick and dense, it can end up forming an extended nebulosity around the star. But um, in addition to winds, you know, the stars that become wolf ray stars can actually undergo explosive events, too. They drive very strong, steady winds, but they can also undergo these eruptions, which we don't fully understand. Um, so there's, okay. there's several modes by which nebulae like this can be created. So help me understand, make sure I've got this right. So you've got a star, 25 or so times the mass of the sun, burning happily its hydrogen core through, or its hydrogen fuel through most of its life, and then it reaches this stage here where it's done, it, it's run out of hydrogen and now it's fusing helium and then it sheds a lot of, it, it, at, at this point it suddenly, does it suddenly have a lot of stellar winds or do these winds, are they always there because the star is so massive? Um, and hey, then there's also this nebula that forms, do all wolf, wolf ray stars have these nebulae? Not all something? of them, but they're very common. Um, all stars have a stellar wind of some sort. Our sun has a stellar wind That's of true. particles. Yes. And it creates the aurora and all these things. Uh, but the, the mass loss rate of the sun is very low and very meager. These, these winds, the, the stars that make Wolf Ray stars, also have winds in their main sequence life or their middle age when they're burning hydrogen. But yes, in this phase, the wind uh, strength really kicks on and becomes very strong. Is that, that just because of the energy uh, involved in fusing helium? Or is it just something, something else going on that causes these winds? Well, the winds can be driven by a variety of mechanisms, but in wolf ray stars, um, they're driven by radiation pressure and what we call line-driven winds because different spectral transitions of the elements in the wind actually absorb the ultraviolet radiation. And that, that radiation pressure becomes very extreme for these stars because they're so hot and they have such a high U, U ultraviolet output. The, the, the driving mechanism becomes very strong for the wind. Okay, all right. And so the, the, you mentioned earlier that this stage in the star's life is pretty short by comparison to its, you know, compared to its entire lifetime. So you, uh, you said, what, 10, 10 million years, did you say, roughly? Well, we think uh, the stars that make wolf ray stars uh, live up to 10 million years, right? As you get to lower their and lower... Their entire amount, lifetime is, is their 10 Their entire million. lifetime, yeah. So, but it can, be, it can be shorter. But, you know, okay. a star that will live 20 million years doesn't, probably doesn't, or 30 million years or 100 million years, probably doesn't have enough mass to become a wolf ray star, right? I see. So, so, so they're definitely living fast path. and dying young. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So yeah, they're very. That's one of the reasons they're interesting. They're interesting in their own right, but because of that fact, they're very good tracers of where star formation is active and vigorous in the galaxy. So where you find Wolf Ray stars, you know that massive star formation is is uh, vigorously occurring. Cool. So they're nice tracers of that around the galaxy, which is so one motivation to map to out their distribution. And note at 
a note added here, Tony, is that the reason they are called Wolf Rayet is not some odd whim of astronomers. It, they were actually first discovered in the mid 1800s by two French astronomers, Wolf and Rayet. And since they're French, the pr correct pronunciation is Rayet. Uh, not I Rayet. Well. I know. I just did that to annoy you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, speaking of, while we're on this topic of two astronomers uh, being used to name a class of star, that's also what happened here with Nasty One, right? I mean, we it got its name uh, because of the two astronomers that discovered it, is that right? Correct. So it's, uh, I believe, J.J. Nassau and Charles Stevenson, and they just took the first two letters of their last names and put them together. And called it Nasty. So look at it. You know, what, when you see that word, what does your brain want to say? Nast one or nasty? Well, I mean, okay, my brain immediately they, said nasty one. But do they have? <laughs> is there a nasty two, three, and four? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good question. There's a whole catalog of stars. So uh, we have the nasty them. scale. I guess. Okay. Is, <laughs> yeah, so I think there is a, a nasty catalog. That's a good point. I never thought of that. <laughs> nasty catalog. Oh my god. Well, I know so what I'm publishing yeah. next. I am publishing the nasty catalog. Yeah. And <laughs> that will never be misconstrued on Astro PA. Oh no, 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 no. no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so let's let's talk about this particular star, the nasty one. Uh, as as Wolf Ray stars go, uh, this one is a little unusual even considering the the for its type of star correct so you you guys used Hubble you looked at it and what did you find what's what's going on with this thing well let me give a little background this this is an object that's defied characterization for a long time um, it made it into the Wolf Ray A catalog because of that presence of that ionized helium line we see in its spectrum um, but the spectrum doesn't really quite look like other Wolf Ray A stars for instance I told you about the fact that Wolf Ray stars drive these very fast winds, sometimes you know thousands of kilometers per second. And when when an outflow is moving that fast, that leaves a very you know characteristic imprint on the spectrum. You can actually directly infer velocities from a spectrum. But the spectrum of a nasty one, the lines are very narrow and look like whatever's there isn't flowing very fast. So it's peculiar. It we. It got into the Wolf Ray catalog, and its its designation is actually WR122. It's its other name besides Nasty One, but uh, it's it's just it's a weirdo. Its spectrum just looks bizarre, and no one really knew what it was. So, uh, in the 90s, um, a group led by Paul Crowther did some imaging of it from the ground, and actually, I have an image. Uh, you pull up that one that says Nasty One ground based. Did you hear that, Scott? Yeah, you've got yeah, it down there. Yeah. Okay, so, so while he's pulling that up, uh, I'm just going to read a comment from Judy Smith, who when we, uh, when we had the other uh, image up of uh, that Scott had shown, uh, she says, yay, I processed that picture of WR-124. So way to go, Judy. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful image. Yeah, it really is. Good job. Okay, so uh, all right. So this star so this you, is the you said is the observer. Right. Pulling this up? Is that it? The yes, one that's that, up? Uh, that four-panel image there. Okay, he's got that's, it up now. Um, that's actually directly taken from this paper, uh, by Paul Crowther in 1999, and actually shows four images of Nasty One, taken through filters that are sensitive to the light from specific elements or specific uh, species of trans atomic transition. So there's H alpha, which is one of the most important hydrogen. Uh, fluorescent emission lines, and then there's uh, nitrogen, two, and helium, you can see there. And notice how in the lower right, the object looks, looks quite a bit more extended than in the other images, right? Yeah. In the, so, was that nitrogen? In the nitrogen two, through the nitrogen two filter, we see it's okay. very extended. Yeah. So we can see from the ground, it's it's the star is surrounded by some kind of nebulosity. Its structure is sort of ambiguous. Uh, mm. So this is really what motivated no, me. No, that's the, the is that so strange? I mean, I, I thought you said that often there are nebulae around these stars. There are, but this one's sort of you know we don't really know what the 
the object. We didn't know what the object was. It had that strange spectrum. You know, we want some clues that help us tease out what's going on. Why does it look so different from other wolf ray stars in its spectrum? Okay. Um, so the, the morphology, the detailed structure of a nebula can help you constrain, you know, what's going on. Um, is that just some outflowing wind? Is it an ejection nebulae like Eta Carina? You know, it has a kind of, you can could convince yourself that there's a bipolar structure to that nebula, kind of like uh, Eta Car, if you pull that image up. Um, we thought that might have been, this might have been an Eta Carina analog when we saw this. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, here, there. Scott's That's got a, that up now. That's a, yeah. This is one of the most beautiful images I've ever seen of. It's uh, my favorite image Hubble's ever produced, honestly. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that object is quite a bit, well, maybe quite a bit closer, and uh, the nebulae's... Well, nebula well give us a real quick okay. background on what this is. I mean, th is th this, this is not a wolf ray star, right? It's not a wolf ray star, uh, but it could be related in that it's headed there, right? So this star is losing... There's a lot of mass in that nebula. Well over yeah. 10 suns of material are in that nebula, and it's coming from the envelope of one of the stars in the system. Yeah, so Eta there's Carina a little... is sort of one of the prototypes for a type of star we call an LBV, which stands for Luminous Blue Variable. Um, it's actually a binary star. Two stars are going around each other in an orbit of something like seven or eight years. Um, but in the 1800s, this star went, underwent a very, very violent eruption that was actually witnessed. Um, and this is the fallout, the aftermath of that eruption in the 1840s, I believe. So we're not talking, to be clear, we're not talking about a supernovae here or an explosion of that kind. We're talking about something on a lot smaller scale, correct? Smaller scale, but actually the energies involved are starting to flirt with supernova energy sometimes in these eruptions. They're very energetic. Not quite a supernova, but very energetic nonetheless. Yeah, I want to point out for those of you who have maybe can't quite see the morphology of this. Uh, in fact, there's been some some three D prints made of this uh, at, at various conferences. But there are two lobes here coming out from that real bright spot in the center, and they are one of them is kind of facing towards us and going down to the lower lower left, and the other lobe is going up to the upper right. Uh, and this is a sort of a an, I don't know if dumbbell is the right word to call it, but it's definitely two well defined lobe shapes. Uh, coming out. Now you're saying Nasty 1 is similar to this and you're thinking it might have features a lot like Eta Car, correct? Well we thought it might be similar to that. We thought that that ground based image we showed earlier is just a, was just a blurrier version of that. If you can imagine, you know, that's a very yeah. high quality yeah. image from Hubble. Imagine looking at that from the ground. Um, it would be kind of, its bipolar structure wouldn't be so clear. You'd probably just see some elongated blob. Right. Now oh. Eta Carina's nebula is also very bright in nitrogen at, at that one specific atomic transition that Nasty One is. So we thought, hmm, or I should say Paul Crowther and Linda Smith, the authors of that paper, thought maybe this is Nasty One is an analog to Eta Carina, but the star in the center is hotter. Maybe become a Wolf Ray star, maybe a slightly more advanced analog of Eta Carina. So. Oh. Where that is strong motivation to follow this up with Hubble to see, well, let's see if this really does look like Eta Car or not. And? And we found something completely different. Um, okay. What, so, you, you, uh, so what did you find? What, what's the, uh, the punchline here on the... Well, let's the bring up, if we can, the nasty one Hubble marked image there. This was actually uh, put out with the press release. Right. So this is what okay. this is a, the Hubble image we saw, and uh, we were very surprised that this is not this is not a bipolar structure. It's something completely different. It looks like an equatorial structure or a disk-like system of gas. I see so that. Yeah, it's telling us this is something something very different is going on um, than we thought. So, so whenever you see a disk like this, or me when I see a disk of this type of structure, it really screams to me binary interaction, right? Um, interacting stars that generate mass loss tend to throw it out in the plane of their orbits. Okay, but now you've confused me again because you also said Eta Car was a binary. I mean, it did not look like this. It didn't. So its eruption is probably <laughs> something, di you know, what gave rise to that ejection of mass is probably a different process. But if you 
if you look at that image, um, Ada Carr again, you can actually see that the bipolar lobes are have a waist, yeah, maybe a skirt. There could be some similar type of structure in the equatorial plane. Although For some we just reason, can't see it. It's kind of overshadowed by the other the other features. Right. Okay. All right, so you're thinking because of this disk here that there's some kind of binary, so there's the Wolf Rayet star, and then it's in a binary system with another star around it. Is that clump there, or is it? No, I guess not. It's in the, it's in the center of the disk there, right? Yeah, unresolved. So whatever stars are fueling all this action are very heavily obscured in this system. We don't have any direct evidence of a binary system. We can't see both stars or resolve them. We're inferring them from the properties of this nebula. Um, but whatever is at the, at the core of this is very opaque gas, and it's very dusty, and it's obscuring the, the spectra of the stars themselves. So um, it's, it's difficult to see their separations, to, their, to get a better estimate of their masses, uh, their orbital period. These are all unknowns. Okay. Um, what's that? What's that clump there? That clump, uh, we think, is just a, a region of enhanced gas density. There's no obvious star associated with that clump. It may okay. just be at some point the processes that were ejecting this nebula maybe intermittently became more violent or uh, stronger and put out a little more gas. We're not quite sure if that's the right explanation, but that's uh, sort of the hunch this moment. So you can see it's, it's kind of a, an inner ellipsoid bright disk surrounded by what looks to be a ring or maybe even an arm coming out with some gap in between. Okay, so there's so, a little line there for two arc seconds. It shows it gives us an idea for scale. Uh, but how big is this thing uh, in other units besides arc seconds? Maybe how, you know, how is there... A, like light years across, or how big is this? Uh, well, in miles, I think it's about two trillion at least. Um, the physical size is uncertain because the distance is uncertain. By you know, uh, it's anywhere from between one to several kiloparsecs away. Uh, but thousands it's of light years. Yeah, so it's inside the galaxy. It's then. in our galaxy. Okay. But, um, Somewhere, in the tr you know, several trillion miles across. Why is it so hard to know how far away it is? I thought most things in our galaxy we could figure out pretty well. Uh, well, not so much. There's often um, substantial uncertainties in our measurements. You know, if you can see a star very clearly and classify it very accurately, and it falls into a certain luminosity class and stuff, then you can infer its distance a little better. But because we can't see the stars directly, we just have this blobby nebula. It's really difficult to get a good distance from that. Okay. So, but you can get a rough idea of the nebula itself, how far away it is. And it's, uh, it's like you said, it's, it's a few, would you say a few kiloparsecs away? Yes, a few kiloparsecs. Okay. Well, um, all right, so as Wolf Ray stars go, then this one's pretty, pretty weird. I, I take it you haven't seen any others like it. Uh, any, this is the only example? This is the only object that we we know of at the phase of evolution we think it's in. There are objects that we think are relatives of this. Uh, Ada Carina is one example that might be, you know, at a similar stage of evolution or an earlier stage. There's another object called R Y Scudi, which is an <laughs> interacting binary system. Actually, I have an image of cute. that. One. What a cute name. Okay. Yeah. That's gonna be my other Twitter handle. Yeah. It's nasty one in our Scooty. <laughs> this is an object my colleague Nathan Smith has studied extensively. And we think this might be an analog to nasty one in an earlier stage before a Wolf Ray has formed. Okay. Um, so that's actually the binary status of our way Scooty is actually very well established. It's actually, actually an eclipsing system. We can see the stars dimming each other's light as they pass in front of each other. Um, so the nebula around our way Scudi is, is much less thick and dense, and it doesn't obscure the central stars to the degree that Nasty 1 is. Okay, so, so think that might be an earlier analog, but still it's quite a bit different, obviously. Okay, and in the, so in the press release you talked about there had been some previous observations of Nasty 1 uh, to give us some more information on the, on the information on the gas and the disk itself. And uh, so what do we know about that 
exactly? What do we know about the gas? For example, do we know how fast it's traveling uh, in, in the uh, in the outer in the outer nebula part? And uh, how does that compare with other stars like it? The gas appears to be moving quite slowly, uh, tens of kilometers per second. Nothing to the degree of a of a wind. That's another hint that whatever ejected this mass isn't kind of your standard wind-driven process. We think it's something governed by the interaction between the stars. But I should say that one of the special things about this nebula that tells us there's massive stars inside is that the nebula is very rich in nitrogen, right, compared to carbon and oxygen. That's a clue that the nuclear processes that make that gas have gone through what we call the CNO cycle. So yeah, explain explain what that is. That's a pretty important part of star of uh, the life of a star. Yeah. So all stars live their majority of their lives by fusing hydrogen into helium, but stars like the Sun and lower mass stars do it in a slightly different way than more massive stars. So in stars like the Sun, they fuse hydrogen to helium via what's called the proton proton chain, and uh, I think we have a diagram of that. It's a kind of a, a more direct means to convert two hydrogen nuclei into a helium nucleus. But for stars about, you know, ten times, you know, greater than, you know, more massive than the sun and up to all the way up uh, to a hundred solar masses, they fuse hydrogen to helium via the CNO cycle. And basically that process uses carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as catalysts for the fusion of hydrogen to helium through a complex chain of reactions. If you could bring up that other one. Okay, hold on. Wait, before we yeah. leave this one, though, this is what the sun does. So we right. we have we we read this from top to bottom, correct? We start at the top and then go down, and and, and then the helium is down correct. at the bottom, correct? Right. So we start with these hydrogen atoms, which fuse together. Photons come off in that one stage, and then we end up with various intermediate stages of these uh, of these atoms, and then finally we end up with the helium atom, right? So we're reading right. this from top to bottom. This is what our sun does. Okay. And right. now that what you're saying, though, is, is that for more massive stars, they undergo something a little bit different. Uh, right. The higher you temperatures, call it? it's called the CNO cycle, for CNO for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Okay. And it uses those elements as catalysts. Um, so the higher temperatures in massive stars, the higher temperatures in their cores, favor this type of reaction, which is a little more complex. So yeah, I'll say, it. look at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so Scott's got this up now, and uh, yeah, there's like six steps, it looks like, before we get there. Right, so you have a, a carbon-12 nucleus comes in contact with a hydrogen nucleus, a proton, to make nitrogen-13, and a photon's emitted. That nitrogen then decays to carbon-13 and emits a, a positron and a neutrino. And then that byproduct... Uh, it meets a hydrogen nucleus again, it makes nitrogen-14 and, and a photon, and so on, this chain of reactions, oxygen ends up becoming involved, and the net product at the end is you get back out the carbon nucleus and the, the helium. Okay, so, so uh, and, and it is this process that makes it so bright in the nitrogen uh, part of the spectrum, correct? Probably, yeah. The net yeah. result of this chain of reactions is that you slowly build up nitrogen and deplete carbon and oxygen. So we can use detailed spectral analysis and nebulae to get ratios of those different elements. And NASTY-1 has one of the highest nitrogen to carbon and oxygen ratios we've ever seen in a nebula. The only other nebula that comes close is Eta Carina. But Eta Carina, as you've already pointed out, has a, is a much more energetic system than this one, correct? It's not as uh, the winds and the, the energies involved in Eta Carina are much higher. Correct. The, the processes that made its nebula were more energetic. But the, that nebula is throwing off material from a star, right? So in both cases, the, the processes might be very different, but we're talking about material from the envelope of a very massive star. And so if in the cores you're building up this nitrogen, you know, that can get mixed out into the envelope of the star. And if that matter is stripped or thrown off by whatever means, the gas that comes off will be very nitrogen rich and it's it's evidence that down in the deep core this is the reaction that's occurring so okay. that's it's, its brightness of nasty one is its luminosity is an indication that there's a massive star in there because massive stars are very luminous but this is kind of a was a, was a clinching 
piece of evidence that the CNO cycle is occurring vigorously in the, the star in the center. Okay, so you've already pointed out that this stuff is shedding material and that it is, uh, uh, you know, doing so at, at, a, at a rate that's a lot less and less energetic than, say, something like Eta Car. But is it doing it, um, is, it, is, it is it a consistent uh, energy flow or is it, is it, you know, are there spurts of it? Are there times where there's more uh, energy coming off of it than others? I mean, what's it like, what, the, the, the mass loss? It's probably very sporadic. So... If it's, if it's indeed driven by binary action, this can turn on and off at several points. So basically, I think we have a movie of two stars interacting. Um, we now know that for massive stars, at least 70% of them have binary companions. And in many of these cases, the, binary, the two stars will end up interacting. That means exchanging mass. And... Uh, if you can bring up this, uh, sorry, I can throw in things at you too quickly, but this uh, roche Loeb overflow diagram, we can look at that after this. So this is just a, a simulation uh, of how two stars interact over the course of their life. They're both on the main sequence here. They're burning hydrogen. But eventually, as one of the stars, the more massive, begins to deplete its hydrogen, it begins to evolve and swell up. Right, and you'll see, you kind of can see that that one star is getting bigger there. Yeah. And so as and, it gets larger, so, oh, there it goes. So there okay. you go. So, so the star has become so large that its outer surface feels the gravity of its companion more strongly than it from itself. And so mass begins to flow in a stream towards the companion in the form of kind of stellar cannibalism. And, and so, in this model, which one is nasty one? If, if this is a, a representative of the system, which one is nasty one? Well, nasty one? one is really kind of the name of the whole system. Oh, okay. okay. All uh, right. You know, if, if you want to <laughs> go far with the analogy, to me, the nasty one would be the one that's doing the cannibalizing. Right? <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, here you got a vampire star, so that's even, right. that's even more. Oh, yeah, uh, more yeah. I just grabbed this from the web. Um, so but, the... Uh, so as it rotates around, this rotation then could be responsible for the sporadic nature of the mass loss that you're seeing. Just, just, by, just by virtue of the, the rotating, the two bodies rotating each other, around each other. Right. What this, what this animation does not convey is that mass transfer is rarely a con, what we call a conservative process. So there's types of mass transfer in astrophysics. When we say mass transfer is conservative, it means all the mass being lost by one of the stars is acquired by the other. But in reality, mass transfer is often non-conservative. So some of the matter gets accreted by the companion, and some of it actually gets ejected. Um, if, if matter flowing toward the companion has high angular momentum and a lot of energy, it can actually be flung from the system into okay. a plane that's parallel to the orbital plane of the system. Now that clump that we saw earlier in the actual Hubble observation, that's not what you're talking I'm sorry? You cut out for a moment there. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think he's he I think he's asking that in the Hubble observation, um, you had said that the two binary stars are down within the center. Um, right. and that, that clump is just some uh, asymmetric coagulation of, of material. It could, be, it could be a byproduct of a phase where the mass transfer suddenly became, became. quite non-conservative, right? Right. So, so some blob gets thrown off and then it, it remains in this disky thing? Right. It's still in that plane, but it's, you know, matter is being flung off all the time and spilled out into a disk. And maybe that arm, the outer points of that arm represent phases, earlier phases in that mass loss. So maybe that's just a you know a period where the mass loss was particularly right. strong. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess I guess we've talked about in the past, and it's not that they're the same thing, but in the lower mass stars, when we have planetary nebula, uh, we see you know we used to think they were you know real smooth, blah blah blah, boring objects, but now we see that that can be episodic too, and that's lower mass stars. So they're 
Sure. One wouldn't be shocked to find out that much more massive stars could have episodes of losing lots and lots of mass, especially when you've got, you know, two things going around and stuff transferring from one place to another. So Right. We now think, you know, some of the exotic shapes of planetary nebulae are probably highly governed by binary interaction and this sort of mass exchange or what we call common envelope evolution. I think I have another diagram that kind of shows a schematic of interacting stars. So I, I had a couple of questions. One of the questions I had was, um, uh, are there, the Wolf Ray A we know, uh, are they pretty much all the same age? Is this the same age where this happens, or is there a wide range of ages where it happens in a star's life? There is a range of kind of extremity in Wolf Ray stars. So and it depends on how much hydrogen has been stripped from their envelopes. So okay. there's different classes of wolf ray star. There's of been course like, there yes. are. <laughs> yeah, it keeps because we're finer and finer. And we have to have not only the classification, but all the subclasses. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> there's, <just> busy. <laughs> there's the nitrogen type, which we call WNs. <laughs> and those tend to have very strong uh, nitrogen features in their spectra. But then there's also carbon type well, for A stars, and the nitrogen becomes weaker and the carbon is very strong. We think those are even more highly stripped because they, they're even hotter and more compact. And guess what? They're called WCs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Very creative. laughs> and then there's WO. Oh, so, yeah, uh, of course. They, they show oxygen. Those that we think are the most heavily stripped. I mean, just a bare core right. of a massive star. So anyway, yeah, I interrupted you. Types. You were going to talk about this graphic, and I think that Tony's back. Right. So uh, this did, I drop you, out? Uh, did I drop out? Because I was just talking happily. Yeah. Did I? Yeah, and we were ignoring you, or yes. at least the internet was. Yeah, the I internet was. I know you froze for a while. Oh, okay. Well, um, anyway, it's for while I'm back, let me... That's uh, okay. We were having a very nice little chat. Yeah, it was I know, great I was with you. Tony. I was listening. I was, I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next... It just so happens Charles Bell, who is always one step ahead and asks really good questions, is asking the next thing I'd like to talk about, which is have he's asking, have you imaged or studied Nasty One in x-rays? Yes, we have. Okay, so. why don't we talk about that for a little bit. So Chandra has taken some observations of this, correct? Right. So once we saw the Hubble images, uh, we were, you know, if you have, if we, if there's a binary star system in there, and you have two massive stars which push strong winds, this is uh, a recipe to make very hot X-ray emitting gas. So in a binary system, if both stars are pushing winds, those winds will collide and make a very strong shock that gets so hot that it emits, emits brightly in x-rays. So we looked at it with Chandra, and indeed we saw that there's a, an x-ray point source right down in the middle of the nebulae. And its properties are consistent with what we've seen in other wolf ray stars and what we call colliding wind binaries. I think we have a movie of uh, a simulation of colliding wind binaries. It's pretty cool. It kind of shows you uh, the, how the fluid dynamics work in that process. Okay. Um, so do we know, so these x-rays, uh, you said there was a, a feature, it, it was consistent with uh, what you thought. Oh, here it is. Okay, so, well, why don't you start by talking about this first, and I'll ask my question. Right, so the stronger wind of the two stars ends up wrapping around the star with the weaker wind. So that little star has a weaker wind. Yeah, it's a little short. Uh, loop it now, these aren't, these aren't observations. Is, is this a model, or what are we looking That's at? That's a model okay. of what's going on deep in the interior. So the x-rays would come from that kind of shocked surface. The leading edge of that, of that, re that red area there that's right at the leading edge of the bow shock. Right. That's probably okay. where it's very bright x-ray emission. And so when I say it's consistent with wolf ray stars, meaning you know, one of the cool things about Chandra when you use its imager is you get energy information. You get you get spectra for free. You get energy information for every photon that hits the detector. And so the range of energies we see in that X-ray spectrum are show that the, the gas is very hot, consistent with what we've seen in other Wolf-Rey stars and Wolf-Rey binaries. So that's it's it's another pillar of support for this binary hypothesis. Okay. 
So are there are there well before I get to that let me uh, Charles is asking a follow up question here uh, are the X rays produced by charge exchange? Oh wow! Um, well, the hey, he does that. Are... He he does that. You got to read him. Well, uh, the X rays are actually thermal, um, so and probably dominated by a process we call thermal bremsstrahlung, which is uh, that's one of my favorite terms. Right. So a, a fo you know, a, uh, the a gas is thin, it's tenuous, but the uh, the particles, the electrons, uh, being accelerated, actually produce uh, the photon. So it's a thermal process, we believe. So okay. I, I don't think charge exchange is uh, necessary. Like it could be happening on some level. We, the colliding with binaries can produce gamma rays as well, and there's evidence for all kinds of particle interactions. Um, so that could be occurring, but we don't think that's what's producing the X-rays we're uh, detecting with Chandra. Awesome. Okay, great. So do you have a sense of the the speed of these winds? Was are were you just able to to tell that they are uh, that they're that they are that one is indeed faster than another, creating this sort of bow shock or this this uh, these X rays at the leading edge? Do you have any idea how fast these winds are? Not really. We can only make assumptions based on what we've seen from other wolf ray stars. Like I said, that nebula is so thick and opaque, we really can't see down in there. Um, the presence of X-rays tells us that there must be fast winds. So, you know, probably on the order of a near a thousand kilometers per second, at least one of the stars should have a wind that fast, because you need to have a fast collision to produce the X-rays. Okay. So, you know, the, the presence of X-rays says we're dealing with, you know, in terms of an order of magnitude, probably a thousand kilometers per second. Nice. Okay. Good. So this is a a, a, a timely question from where. All you guys are driving this discussion now because this is right where I wanted to go next. Uh, Spencer Rose Roseboro Roseboro is asking, "I'm in high school physics, and my question is, will this star explode to a supernova?" And let me just ask in a different way something I was going to ask you, which is, "What's next for this star? Uh, after uh, what's the next stage of its life?" Well, its phase is uncertain. It all kind of depends on whether it goes supernova soon or not. Um, to answer that. First question, it absolutely it will go supernova. It's a, we, we know it's a massive star in there. The question is, how long does it have? If it were to blow up right now, it would be spectacular because you have all that matter surrounding the system. So if an explosion, a supernova explosion occurs, it's going to have to encounter all that mass. And when that happens, that gives rise to a very particular type of supernova we call a type 2N or an interacting supernova where the ejecta hits the material cast off by the stars before the supernova and through that interaction a lot of energy is generated. You convert all this kinetic energy into radiation and light and so you can get very luminous uh, types of supernovae that way. So and, if it and blows because it's in our soon, galaxy it's going to be pretty spectacular, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely be able to see it with... Uh, well, yeah. and uh, along with that question, I have one from Twitter that actually brings that up. It also has a second part question. So let me pull this up here. This is from Astro JJE. Um, he's asking you know, if the Wolf Ray, and he's uh, at a meeting uh, in Potsdam last week with two big questions Do they explode in supernovae? And also, are they inflated and what causes it? Well, those are both great questions. I would say to question one, Absolutely, they probably explode as supernovae. We see evidence in other galaxies of supernovae that are very depleted or show no hydrogen at all. Sometimes not even helium. These are what we call stripped envelope supernovae. So that's direct evidence that wolf area stars do explode, if indeed those are coming from wolf area stars, and we think they are. But are they inflated? Well, you know, when stars become very in, in extremely inflated, they tend to look cooler, right? Um, so the most inflated stars we call red supergiants. Um, right. If they can become that extended, the envelope obviously cools off as it expands. Um, but who knows, they, they might inflate right before they explode from some process we don't understand. Um, we have evidence now that some stars, before they go supernova, actually have sporadic 
jumps in brightness. Um, one of the coolest examples of that um, that I wrote a paper on a few years ago was this object Supernova 2009 IP where we watched this very massive star undergo these extreme brightness variations for several years between 2009 and in 2012 the thing went crazy and became much more luminous than it ever had been before and showed velocities consistent with a supernova explosion. So we think we witnessed a star undergoing its final death throes. What causes that? We don't understand. It could be some instability related to the nuclear burning that's occurring in the core. You know, as you you burn hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon and oxygen, and so on and so on, into silicon and neon and all these things, those latest stages of nuclear burning could be very explosive once they kick on. And this could make the star undergo wild uh, variations. They might inflate in the process before they explode. Um, but we don't really we don't have a very complete understanding of, of what drives those processes, what inflates them, what, what drives their sporadic explosive mass loss. These are open questions and very active areas of research that I'm very interested in. Yeah, awesome. Right. So while we're there, Scott, you, while you have Twitter, while you have the Twitter up, anything else we should uh, mention? Any, how's it going? It's going great. Um, there are some questions, but not quite related to our show today, um, <laughs> as, as they tend to be. And just, yeah, a lot of uh, people really loving the, the images and the, the graphics that are going out there. Okay. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's some questions that we can bring up in other episodes. But other than that, no, we're good. Do we have time to show that other GIF movie? movie yeah. 11? Yeah, sure. This um, is interesting because well, well, this is related yeah, yeah. to the X-ray situation we were talking about, the colliding wind process. And this, when you talk about what's next for Nasty One, this could be a good example. This is a star called Wolf Ray 104. And uh, this is an image taken in the infrared, and we think that emission is from hot dust. So Nasty One has a very bright dust component down in the core. We know whatever is happening there is creating lots of hot dust. And we think this might be a relative. So this is a, a Wolf-Ray A binary that's probably at a more advanced stage of evolution. And that, that collision, that wind collision process, is making dust in a spiral morphology, creating this sort of pinwheel nebula. So if uh, Nasty One lives a long time, long enough to blow away that nitrogen nebula and become a Wolf-Ray star and create more dust, we might, it might do something like this. We won't be alive to see it, but this is a potential future fate for that system if it doesn't go supernova right away. Okay. Uh, I don't I don't think Nikolai Ivanov is asking, and I don't think we covered this, so I'll ask it uh, uh, now. Is that gas disk a recent event? How old is it? In other words, how long has the, has the gas disk been around, do you know? Well, that's a good question. Um, based on our current best constraints for the velocity of that gas. I mentioned tens of kilometers per second. Taking that and its size, an order of magnitude would say, you know, on the order of a thousand years or so. Okay. So um, and, it and could be already it, mentioned these stars don't live very long to begin with. So this is a really short period, comparatively speaking, in the life cycle of this star. So it's a pretty right. it's a pretty rare glimpse, uh, right? Have you seen this I mean obviously you have uh, this is pretty exciting. It's from this individual's perspective, but there aren't many of these around that you've that you've seen, right? No, there aren't, and it's a very it's very important to catch stars in this process because this is one of the channels by which you make Wolf Ray stars. I said, you know, they can they can do it themselves. The traditional model shows that they blow off their envelopes on their own through winds and explosions, but if if this is important, if you can strip an envelope by binary interaction, this could be a very important channel for making wolf ray stars that shouldn't be ignored. And indeed, it seems we need this channel to account for their numbers in the galaxy and for the fractions of different types of supernovae we see in other galaxies. It's looking like this binary interaction mode of wolf ray formation is, is more important than we ever thought. Wow. And so, but because it's so short-lived, we don't have many examples, so it's difficult to understand. So Nasty One's very important in that regard because yeah. it's, uh, it's one of those examples, rare examples of binary-induced wolf ray formation. And Scott has the uh, artist uh, sketch of it, uh, sort of schematic of what we think that system looks like. It's really beautiful with the, you see the binary interaction you were talking about along with the uh, disk itself. And so um, 
as you pointed out, this is a pretty important subclass of these stars, so hopefully we'll be able to learn a lot about what causes these things um, and it, it get a better understanding of this stage in a, in a massive star's life. Uh, Carol, do you have any other questions? Scott, do you have anything you'd like to ask? Yeah, um, I, I, I do. Question from okay, go ahead. Dr. Carol, go, go Carol. Okay, um, we asked, one of the questions was, what is next for this star? Um, my question is, do we have any observations that are hints of a system about to do this? Or the early stages of this? About, about to become nasty one like? Yeah. Uh, pr probably that. <laughs> about that. to get nasty. On way. <laughs> way to becoming nasty. <laughs> uh. Well, our way, Scooty, that object we briefly discussed, we think might be a more um, okay. an earlier analog of this. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so can I say that it's Scooty towards nasty? Is that <laughs> what's going on? No, you can't say that. No. It, I, I already yeah. did. It's on yeah. You did. I can't oh, even hear that now. Thank oh. you, Scott. I appreciate that. Oh, dear. Sorry I asked. <laughs> the thought, the, 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 the nickname has gotten this star a lot more attention. So I yeah, it's yeah, it's good. It's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Science. Uh, this one's from Explore Deep Space on Twitter. It says that uh, when the star explodes, what effects will it have on Earth's life or surroundings? So you know, we you've mentioned earlier that we're not we don't have precise measurements of exactly how far away it is, but you know, if if we're saying it's you know thousands of of was it thousands of parsecs away? So it could have already done something momentous, and we just haven't seen it yet. Right? Uh, is there any effects that uh, that it could you know have on Earth if it's headed in our general direction? I don't believe so. Um, at that distance, uh, I don't think there there would be any threat to harm to life on Earth. Um, I think it would just put on a very spectacular light show. It might be visible during the day. Something very, uh, an extreme astronomical event, no doubt, but uh, probably not uh, anything to worry about. So uh, it just means that we can we can read at night with you know something out shining the moon, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> that uh, that interaction process I told you, if it runs into all that gas, it'll be a very bright supernova indeed. So I hope it explodes. <laughs> as, you know, as we, we do now, is would it be visible? Uh, is this in the northern or southern hemisphere? Really this isn't. It's kind of at the boundary. It's at a, a declination of close to zero, so it's right around the celestial equator. Okay. So it's it's visible from both the north and south hem, uh, southern hemispheres. So everyone gets the benefit of it. Probably, so yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, good. So that's it. Okay. So, uh, Carol, did you wanna did you wanna add something? Or you... No, I okay. I uh, I promise not to make I, it nasty. I, I, no, no. I mean, I've been, you know, no, I've been. That's fine. <laughs> I don't want to get in further trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One more quick question, and then uh, then we'll we'll sign off. Here is Juan Borda is asking, what's the period of the binary system? Do you have that level of information on the on the on the binary itself? No, we don't. You're, you're just actually just speculating there's one, that there is one at all, actually, aren't you? The evidence is indirect at this time. Yeah. Um, that's one of the things we really want. We, we want to uh, get a binary period. We don't know, but um, one of the plans we have is to monitor this thing for brightness changes. You know, those colliding when binaries, we showed some examples, tend to show periodic changes in brightness. And if you can get the period of that brightness change and it looks regular, that gives you an idea of the orbital period, or gives it to you directly. So that's one of the things we want, and one of the things we're going to go after. But awesome. That's a great question. Yeah, it is a good question. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Michael Jobin, a couple of comments, screaming out at all caps, fireworks! And Charles Bell is saying, yay, Judy, in reference to the uh, <laughs> processing of that image earlier. Um, and uh, finally, Charles Bell is asking a sort of a general question, and I don't, I'm not sure if, we can, if you can answer that or not, but can you, is there, I'm not, He's asking, can you recommend a current astrophysics textbook? Are there any uh, texts that are currently out there that maybe include some of the more recent information on this? You know, all the books I have were, are from the late 90s. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're great, but I don't think you're going to find them. And there's probably, you know, a lot's happened since then. So I know. That's the thing about astronomy, especially especially the, uh, after uh, over the past 10 years or so. You really got to keep up on your yeah, astronomy books. But I have one that I love that's kind of an undergraduate level, but it's full of a lot of uh, a lot of the 
intro astrophysics and some mathematical application stuff. Well, Zylik and Gregory can show it to you if you want. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it's, that is. Uh, I had a, I had a few. I think from was it Peebles? I, I forget the I forget the author's name now. But anyway, it was cosmological physics was a, was one of them, and then uh, a couple of others that I have. But they're all old too, just like yours. Yeah. Mine are back from the nineties as well. Cosmological so I don't have physics is sorry, pretty, Charles. Pretty deep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. guys. If, well, if I guess. If you want sorry, so, oh, self promotion. If you want a public type of astronomy book, 250 Questions About Astronomy by myself and two other authors on Amazon. It's oh. actually three years old and we probably have to update it, but it's I good. didn't know you had a book out there on Amazon, Carol. I do. The, the, ori about it. the original version's in French. So this <laughs> is the retranslated back to English. Anyway, and you won't I you expect you to send me one that's signed. I um, know. I don't see what's, what's up, Carol? I have room back here for, for... I didn't know you had a book. That's great. I have French copies of it. <laughs> I'll take it. I took French. I could read it. Send Since me a we are copy. talking about Wolf Ray A stars. That's, that's true. true. <laughs> very, very French. Very cosmopolitan today. Uh, okay, guys. Well, I guess that's it. Um, I'm going to go ahead. It's, we, will, uh, we will stop there. I want to thank our guest, John... Uh, uh, John Marahan from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Thank you for stopping by, and I oh, hope you'll let us know. Thank you for having me. Yeah, are yeah, you going to be uh, you going to be following up uh, on this with more observations in the future? Yes, indeed. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, 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 in the chamber. So hopefully, those get accepted. We'll have more to right. say. Actually, this week, yes, I think. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very soon now. Yep. Yeah. That's well, being decided no. this week, I believe. I have uh, no. I have no. I haven't seen the list, so I. Can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. So we don't know, but the committee is meeting this week to decide the next uh, the next cycle of observations for Hubble. So hopefully you'll be in there, and if you are, you will. We, we hope you'll come back and tell us what you find out. Will you do that? I'd love to. Awesome. Great, yeah. thank you. All right, well, guys, that's it. Thank you all for watching. Uh, next week we're going to be talking about quasars. We got another. Uh, we're going to be looking at Hubble observations of the early formation of quasar activity. So if you want to learn all there is to know about quasars, we hope you'll tune in. And check it out. Uh, we will uh, we will be here with the guests making those observations. So, on behalf of Carol and Scott, I want to thank you all for another great hangout. Thank you all for watching. And as always, keep, keep looking, up. looking up. Thank you. Spectacular nebulosity that uh, you can see from the structure appears to be flowing away from the star, and it is. How That's is this different? That is like a planetary nebula to me. How is that different? Well. Um, the processes by which the wind is generated are a little different. This is driven by radiation pressure from the star, we think. Um, very strong winds from these stars, just from the, the sheer force of their radiation, pushes, puts pressure on the envelope and drives a very strong wind. If, this, if the wind is very uh, thick and dense, it can fo end up forming an extended nebulosity around the star. But um, in addition to winds, you know, the stars that become wolf Ray stars can actually undergo explosive events, too. They drive very strong, steady winds, but they can also undergo these eruptions, which we don't fully understand. Um, so there's, there's several modes by which nebulae like this can be created. So help me understand, make sure I've got this right. So you've got a star, 25 or so times the mass of the sun, burning happily its hydrogen core, through, or its hydrogen fuel through most of its life, and then it reaches this stage here where it's done, it, it's run out of hydrogen and now it's fusing helium and then it sheds a lot of, it, it, at, at this point it suddenly, does it suddenly have a lot of stellar winds or do these winds, are they always there because the star is so massive? Um, and yeah, then there's also this nebula that form, do all Wolf, Wolf Ray stars have these nebulae? Not all of them, but they're very common. Um, all stars have a stellar wind of some sort. Our sun has a stellar wind That's of true. particles. Yes. And it creates the aurora and all these things. Uh, but the, the mass loss rate of the sun is very low and very meager. These, these winds, the, the stars that make Wolf Ray stars also have winds in their main sequence life or their middle age when they're burning hydrogen. But yes, in this phase, the wind uh, strength really kicks on and becomes very strong. Is that, that just because of the energy uh, involved in fusing helium? Or uh, very strong winds are often surrounded by nebulae. So when you look at the spectrum of these stars, you see a, a very bright uh, feature in the, where, where helium would be uh, in emission, right? Right. So, that's, that's one of the keys, is that you have to see a line of singly ionized helium, what we call helium-2. 
and that shows you that the temperatures in the stellar atmosphere and its wind are high enough to be. So they've got. So these are, stars. as you said before, they're they're very massive stars. How compared to our sun, how big are they generally? Well, the traditional model uh, says that stars about 25 solar masses or greater can become. Wow, really? Greater so our sun will not do this. Our sun will not pass through that, this stage in its evolution. Definitely not. Okay, so uh, but more recent models are showing that you can actually get Wolf Ray stars in a lower mass range than we thought, and uh, that's one of the interesting, uh, you know, relative so 20, topics for nasty one. <laughs> about twenty-five. Sorry, <laughs> you're gonna have to. I'm gonna laugh every time you say it. it yeah, that might be that may be the topic <laughs> of this week's drinking game. Um, so the the uh the they're roughly 25 times the mass of our sun, and because they're primarily burning helium, that means that they are pretty old, right? They're pretty far along in their, in their lives. Is that true? Well, they're probably 90% through their life, but the stars that do this actually don't live very long, just uh, less than 10 million years, maybe only several million years. You mean this stage in their lifetime? This is a pretty small window when, they, when they're like this. Right. So, uh, you know, they've probably been alive for several million years, and the, the stage at which they, over which they display these wolf ray properties is probably only on the order of 100,000 years or several hundred thousand years, so uh, a okay, fraction so of their lifetime. So Scott's got an image up here. Is this one now? Is this what we're looking at? Yeah, that's a very famous wolf ray star, and the nebula is called uh, M1-67. And you can see it's surrounded by this spectacular... Or is it just something, something else going on that causes these winds? Well, the winds can be driven by a variety of mechanisms, but in wolf ray stars, um, they're driven by radiation pressure and what we call line-driven winds because different spectral transitions of the elements in the wind actually absorb the ultraviolet radiation. And that, that radiation pressure becomes very extreme for these stars because they're so hot and they have such a high U, U ultraviolet output, the, the, the driving mechanism becomes very strong for the wind. Okay, all right. And so the, the, you mentioned earlier that this stage in the star's life is pretty short by comparison to its, you know, compared to its entire lifetime. So you, uh, you said, what, 10, 10 million years, did you say, roughly? Well, we think uh, the stars that make Wolf Ray stars uh, live up to 10 million years, right? As you get to lower their and lower, their entire now, lifetime is, is their 10 entire million. lifetime. Yeah. So, but it can be it can be shorter. But you know, okay. a star that will live 20 million years doesn't probably doesn't, or 30 million years, or 100 million years probably doesn't have enough mass to become a Wolf Ray star. Right? I see. So, so, so they're generally living fast mass. and dying young. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'd so like yeah, they're compare. very. That's one of the reasons they're interesting. They're interesting in their own right, but because of that fact, they're very good tracers of where star formation is active and vigorous in the galaxy. So where you find Wolf Ray stars, you know that massive star formation is is uh, vigorously occurring. Cool. So they're nice tracers of that around the galaxy, which is so one I motivation to map to out their distribution. A note a note added here, Tony is that the reason they're called Wolf Ray is not some odd whim of astronomers. It, they were actually first discovered in the mid-1800s by two French astronomers, Wolf and Ray. So on the very bottom left, you'll see some yellow text there saying that we're answering your questions because we are. It will load up a new interface, and it will allow you to answer questions. And you can even upvote different questions. So if you see a question that somebody's asked and you want to know the same thing, you can upvote it. Also, like Tony said before, we are over on Hubble Telescope, and we're using the hashtag Hubble Hangout, and so I'm monitoring that, and I'll be live tweeting as we're going along there. So please let us know any uh, questions or comments or anything else that you'd like the, uh, the panel to respond to, and we'll get those going throughout the show. Great. Thank you, Scott. So joining me, uh, as I said before, we have uh, uh, astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope to look at this very special class of stars known as Wolf Ray A stars. And joining me is Dr. John Mauerhan from the University of California at Berkeley. He's an astronomer there. Welcome, John. 
Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to talk with you. So a couple of weeks ago, we did a press release on some of your observations on these stars. And I want to get to your science here in just a minute. But before I do, let's give people a little bit of background on what these stars are. These are a subclass. We, I mean, astronomers love to do this. They, cl they classify and catalog everything. This is a special type of star. Why don't you tell us what they are? Well, wolf a star is you know, an evolved state of the most massive stars uh, in the galaxy and in other galaxies. And what makes them, what highlights them observationally is that they've lost a certain amount of their hydrogen envelopes. You know, most stars are 90% hydrogen and a lot of that's in the envelopes surrounding it. They've lost these envelopes through winds and eruptions and other processes we'll get into such that the, the surface becomes very hot, the visible surface is very hot as you expose deeper and deeper layers. Uh, it becomes almost like a helium core, if it can. So um, these stars are observationally characterized by very strong emission lines of helium. Hello Hubble Huggers and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute and I know you're not going to believe this but we've done it again. We've got another great hangout planned for you today. We're going to be talking about a very special kind of star called Wolf Rayet stars. I always want to use my southern accent and call them Wolf Rayet, but I just, uh, I guess I'll, I'll use a correct pronunciation today. But in particular, we're also going to be talking about a very strange kind of star even within this subset of stars uh, which has been nicknamed Every time I say this, I always think this might be a, a license plate it. for uh, a license, like a personalized license plate for Scott or something. Nasty yeah, one. Really? You're in Florida. <laughs> Nasty one. Florida. Come on, nasty one would be a Florida license plate. Yeah, that's what you're right with it. <laughs> so N -A -S -T -one. anyway, <laughs> so anyway, we're going to be talking about this very interesting star today with uh, with our guest. But before I get started, I want to invite you guys to. Send us your questions and comments. Uh, and also, if you have not subscribed to us on YouTube, you need to do that on the Hubble Site channel as well as follow us on Twitter with at space or at Hubble Telescope. And I'm and with me every week, as they always are, is Dr. Carol Christian. She's the Hubble Outreach Scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. Hi, Carol. Hello, hello. And also Scott Lewis, who's here to help us with the social media and driving of the inter internet all around. Uh, good guy. Hi, Scott. It's good to see you again. I wouldn't say I'm a good guy, but well, thank you're you, Tony. Nasty, very, guy, yeah. Yeah. nasty one. <laughs> nasty one. Nasty that's gonna be, one. Yeah, that's going to be on. That needs to be on your lower third now. Now I need a new Twitter handle. That's as right. If I don't have enough. I don't know. I think John and no. <laughs> okay, so uh, before we get started, uh, Scott, why don't you tell people how they can leave their questions and comments because uh, we hope that you will get uh, a lot of interaction with you guys uh, throughout the Hangout. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, so the, the best way for you to get engaged with us is through the Q&A app, which is uh, both engaged on Google Plus and on YouTube. So 